Well, welcome to our three-part alfalfa live stream series sponsored by L4X Seeds. Our topic today is alfalfa, the Rodney danger field of field crops, why it deserves more respect. I'm your host, Corey Geiger, editor of Hordes Dairyman and member of the editorial team that also publishes the Hay and Forage Grower and the Journal of Nutrient Management. We are broadcasting from the Cheese Cave, our studio in downtown Fort Atkinson at the historic W.D. Horde and Sons Company building commissioned by Wisconsin Governor W.D. Horde. When it comes to alfalfa, our company has deep roots with the forage crop as our magazine's founder, William Dempster Horde, was instrumental in growing alfalfa's popularity throughout the Midwest and transforming Wisconsin into America's dairyland. In fact, the governor's research is the main reason that the Hordes Dairyman Farm was placed on the National Register of Historic Places by the U.S. Department of Interior in 1977. These days, alfalfa makes up a large part of cattle rations across the country and around the world. And our team here at Hordes is proud to produce these alfalfa live streams with our friends at L4X Seeds. Our presenters will welcome questions from our viewers during the final 15 minutes of our hour-long webcast. To answer a question, use the GoToWebinar control panel and type a question into that panel. I'd first like to welcome Ron Cornish, General Manager of L4X Seeds. L4X Seeds and their partners provide ruminant animal producers and commercial hay growers with agronomic support education, and alfalfa varieties for today's alfalfa growers. Thanks for joining us, Ron. Thanks, Corey. Glad to be here. Um, I'd like to personally welcome uh, you to Alfalfa Livestream webinar series sponsored by Alforic Seeds. And we know there are a lot of choices out there when it comes to purchasing alfalfa seed. One thing that sets us apart is our focus on alfalfa and forage excellence. We pride ourselves on variety development with our connection to our parent company, Corteva AgriScience. Their ability to deploy technologies in alfalfa used in other crops in research gives us a real competitive advantage in the market. We thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to watch this webinar today. And our intent is to provide you with some good information that, you, that can help you increase productivity on your farm or your customer's farm. We're excited to kick off this second of three alfalfa live stream webinars today, and we hope you'll find the webinar informative and be able to take away a few key points that you can use to manage your alfalfa crop. So again, thank you. Hope you'll enjoy the webinar, and Corey, back to you. Thanks so much, Ron, and we're so pleased with this partnership now for the second year in a row. And let's go right into some audience interaction here. And our first poll question is gonna be, when is the best time to make a tonnage or quality decision? Select one of the following, first cutting, second cutting, third cutting, or it simply doesn't matter. So go ahead and answer that poll and we'll uh, see how those results uh, come in. And as we're doing that, we'll invite uh, Glenn Shoemaker to go ahead and turn his webcam on as he is the first presenter here. And so once the audience has a few more seconds to answer that poll, we'll go ahead and close it off. And hopefully we'll see those results in a second. And as we're doing that, I will like to welcome Glenn Shoemaker to Alfalfa Livestream. Glenn is Emeritus Professor an Emeritus Extension Forage Specialist with the University of Idaho, located at the Kimberley Research and Extension Center. Raised on an irrigated row crop and forage farm near Kimberley, Idaho, Glenn continues to be actively involved with his family's farm producing alfalfa hay and other forages. In fact, forages support the farm's beef cow and calf operation on irrigated pasture in southern Idaho and rangeland in northern Nevada. Glenn, I look forward to your thoughts on alfalfa, and I'm going to ask Michaela to put that poll question results back up on the screen here. And if you want to make any initial comments on that, please go ahead, Glenn. Thanks, Corey. And, and yes, certainly first cutting is the most important uh, cutting from a profit, a profitability and, uh, and animal nutrition standpoint. So my task today is to uh, talk about how we can manage yield or quality and how to know what makes you the most profit. Now, I'm not an economist, but we know that we need to know several things to be able to 
optimize our production and the nutritional value of the forage. And so that is the yield and the rate of yield increase, the quality, the forage quality, and the, dec the rate of decline of forage quality. And then we need to know curtain prices and we need to know uh, expected situations. So I will attempt to uh, help you enlighten you on those different aspects. My page isn't going down. <clears throat> there we go. So one source of information that helps, gives us these rate of changes is this publication led by Jeff Brink uh, from the US Dairy Forage Research Center. They funded this project. And this is, uh, was carried out in three locations, uh, South Central Idaho uh, and uh, Central, uh, South Central Wisconsin and Central uh, Pennsylvania. And we used three varieties uh, and this was done over several cuttings. We, we basically started at the vegetative stage at a certain height and then harvested every five days for that cutting. And um, some of the results that we can, we can see There we go. So this is this is for Idaho. I, I don't have time to show all the results, and I'll but I'll show you another easy source of this information. But for Idaho, we know that yield will increase during that first harvest, the first cutting, at 120 pounds per acre. That's uh, dry matter per acre per day. And you can see during the middle summer cuttings, that rate of yield increase is much higher. On the other hand, we can look at forage quality with one of our better measurements, I think, is neutral detergent fiber digestibility. And we see the rate of decline. So the green is the harvest one, and we can see the slope of that line is minus 0.3. So minus 0.3% NDF digestibility per day. Now, even though that's, a, that's just 0.3, that, that is very important. This is very highly related to the amount of intake an animal can can uh, sustain, and therefore the amount of protein and energy that that they can get from that uh, forage product. And you can see that the rate of decline is much higher in the harvest two and three. Okay, now if we look at Wisconsin. Again, the green bar and circles are the first cutting. That is increasing similarly 130 pounds per acre per day. And if we look at NDF digestibility, the rate of decline is a little more, minus 0 0.4. Now this, this is fairly close to where numbers in Idaho, uh, but Idaho was an irrigated site, whereas Wisconsin and Pennsylvania were not. So that affects these results, certainly. Uh, the alfalfa was not water stressed in Idaho. So this table summarizes the data for the rate of dry matter production after that vegetative stage. So again, there's the numbers. Now, Pennsylvania had an incredible uh, growth rate there, uh, probably related to the weather, uh, desirable growing conditions. I know we had frost in Idaho and in Wisconsin. So uh, that might explain it. Um, and then you can see the early summer, highly variable, again, depending on environment. So that's why you need some really local information and your historical records actually will be the best measure of that. Oh, and this is the rate of NDFD digestibility change per day. And so that just summarizes that. Again, very similar, but even a 0.1% uh, makes the difference there. And you can see that during the summer, that's different. 
So let's look at the milk per acre uh, values here versus alfalfa maturity, uh, because this is the bottom line. This is this is income per acre, which both uh, the producer needs to know, and if it's a dairyman that has his own forage land, then this this is also important. So we can see that after about 10 days, that after the vegetative stage, that plateaus. The milk per acre kind of plateaus there. Again, yield is increasing, but neutral detergent fiber digestibility is declining. So that 10 days point after it, the alfalfa reaches vegetative stage appears to be the sweet spot for first cutting. So my arrow works. And there's late summer. We can see that it, it doesn't plateau in this case. Um, yield is increasing and forage quality is declining rapidly. Yeah, and this is a source of information. If you're more interested in, in this work, then uh, I don't expect you to type in all of that website, but just do a Google search you know, for US Dairy Forage Research Center. And when you get there, you can search for Brink, the uh, primary author of that, uh, Jeff Brink, and, and you should bring to this. So this has more detailed information for those different sites. Now, the other thing that I like to use is this hay cut date spreadsheet that uh, Bill Lazarus and Dan Undersander from the University of Wisconsin and Minnesota developed. That's available if you search for hay cut date Undersander it, once you're in the University of Wisconsin extension. So uh, now we'll blow that up a little bit. We'll show you where we, we can focus a little more on the inputs. And so I'm, I've modified this for Idaho. And so I put down May 10th uh, as, as the date that we need to use uh, of the first possible cut. And the yield I would expect on that date, again, due to records is two tons per acre. And we would put in the RFV expected on that date. I use the uh, prediction stick um, based on the peak method. And that comes out at 200 relative feed value as standing. We, uh, it, they also include a calculation there and input for the RFV loss expected during harvest. And with good management, you can get by with 15% harvest loss. Um, that can get a lot worse. So that's an important assumption you need you need to, to know. Uh, so that corrects it to 170 relative feed value as harvested. And 180 RFV in the West, uh, Idaho, California is kind of the the main uh, the main criteria there for that. And you can see we entered the yield at 120 pounds per acre, uh, RFV at uh, minus 2.5 points per day. That's not percent, but it's points per day. And the, the RFV of the base hay price I've entered at uh, 180. Again, that's dairy quality hay. The price of dairy quality hay at the, at the latest uh, uh, USDA uh, Ag Marketing Service numbers is $250 per ton. Feeder hay price is unusually high at $220 per ton. And I, I added that to, to make this calculation of the premium per point of RFV plus or minus that base, which I set at 180. Um, and, and that calculates to 60 cents per point of RFV. Now, a lot of hay producers in our area have just Use the rule of thumb that hay is worth a a dollar per point of RFV. Well, that that doesn't reflect the current market situations, and I discourage being stuck on one number. You need to look at the real values of dairy quality hay, compare it to feeder quality hay, and make that calculation on of the on the real data. And then uh, 
we, we can input our harvesting cost per acre expected. I put 37 tons per acre by converting some values on our budgets uh, per bale or per ton to on an acre basis based on that two tons per acre. And then I've added uh, $5 per ton would be the expected harvesting cost per acre over that base uh, ton. So on the next page, we can see the results. And this shows us that the 10th of June is the profit maximizing harvest day. And the yield that we would expect on this date is 3.8 tons. It would be 93 RFV values. So that is certainly below, uh, it's below even full bloom alfalfa. So that tells us that, you know, our linear model isn't quite fitting this kind of a situation. Um, because it's really curvilinear, but we we need to simplify it to a linear version. But regardless, you, you, you need to make sure these numbers are somewhat uh, predictable and, and look appropriate. So that value of the hay would be $198 per ton. If it was harvested on that date, we would have $46 harvesting cost, and the net revenue in that case is $716. So on the next slide, we see, um, and what, one of the reasons I really like this spreadsheet is it has this uh, sensitivity table, which so you can slide these values, the input values, and it shows you the graph uh, in real time. So, so a very nice spreadsheet in that regard. Well, in this case, we can see that the, the green bar is the net return, and that increases from 450 up to that $740 per ton. And we can see that that's largely driven by yield because that uh, RFV is declining. Now on the next page, I reduced the price of utility alfalfa to where it probably should be. There's a shortage of hay in the West because of the droughts. It really ought, should, ought, should be no more than $150 per ton. Uh, so that gives us a much different looking curve. And we can see on this one that the profit is maximized at about uh, uh, 524, somewhere in that week, 517, uh, clear out to Memorial Day, we, we could get the most return per acre. But that is substantially less than, uh, than if that, utility alfalfa was priced higher. So it again, it depends on the year, it depends on the uh, latest numbers and the local situation. So on the next slide, we, we certainly encourage that you, you predict the yield increase and the quality, go out and measure that, get that prediction stick, use the peak method. There are some cutting date services, uh, some, labs provide uh, so use those to get and use your own records to get the information that you need to be able to properly determine the value of your forage crop either as, if you're a hay producer or if you're a dairy producer producing your own so use all those tools and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity Thank you, Glenn. That picture on the screen there has me thinking of spring right now when it's zero degrees outside. I can <laughs> assure you of that. And just uh, most of the people in the audience will know, but the uh, the peak stick is predictive equations of alfalfa quality, and it's a great determinant of relative feed value. So um, there's been a lot of science put behind that, and it's a really good tool when it comes to uh, measuring quality and cutting, making cutting decisions. So with that, we're going to go to uh, our next poll question. And as a reminder, as you hear from our audience and our panelists today, audience, please submit your questions in the GoToWebinar question panel. And the earlier you ask a question, the more likely we'll be able to answer it. So uh, let's go to this poll question. Can it be more profitable to raise, alf raise your own alfalfa for protein instead of buying soybean meal? This is a simple yes or no question. So go ahead and give an answer to it. And I know our next speaker will have some thoughts uh, as to his answer on this. And quite frankly, he's changed his opinion a little bit over time here, and I respect that. 
he's uh, willing to update his opinion. So let's go ahead and show the results of that poll question and the answer 92%. Wow, Dr. John Gazer, that's what I'd say at first. John is an animal nutrition director at Rock River Laboratory in Watertown, Wisconsin, and an adjunct professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the Animal and Dairy Science Department. John is also a private consultant with Cows Agree Consulting and is a regular columnist to both Hordes Dairyman and the Hay and Forge Gore family of publications, both in print and online. John, how has your mind changed when reflecting on the economic conditions for 2019 versus what we're facing in here in 2022 when it comes to alfalfa versus soybean meal question? John? Well, I appreciate the opportunity to come in and contribute today uh, and acknowledge the fact that I am a flip-flopper. When new information comes to light, I'm not opposed to shifting my view on something. So that that uh, hopefully is well received by the audience today. And certainly, I, I, I maybe I don't have to do all that much convincing. It seems that the audience is uh, fairly in tune with the fact that uh, alfalfa can be a really high quality source of protein, and perhaps it makes a bit more sense uh, to grow alfalfa this year than, than to buy soybean meal. But rather than just uh, say that with words, uh, we can dive into it uh, in just a little bit different fashion. So in uh, the spirit of Rodney Dangerfield, let's dance. Uh, we'll jump into this over the next 10, 15 minutes, and I will uh, wade through a few slides here. Uh, but but as we get into it, um, as I follow in uh, Glenn's footsteps here just a bit, he, he presented some great information in regards to timing that cut. Timing the, the first harvest is, is imperative. Uh, Corey had acknowledged the, the peak stick. That is a very valuable tool for first cut. Uh, and first cut only. Uh, as the year goes on, we need to make use of scissor cutting and, and other tools. But when we look at what alfalfa can bring to your farm, uh, whether you're growing or, and, and selling or, or growing for your, your herd, dairy and beef, alfalfa presents uh, some great potential and rewards. It's a perennial crop, can bring quite a bit of protein and can bring some very digestible fiber and sugar. Uh, in addition to that high value protein, uh, depending upon our, our variety, of course, and, and management, strategies, cut timing primarily. However, alfalfa also presents a bit of risk. Uh, historically, we've been managing three to five year stands. More recently, with some of the uh, tumultuous winters for some of us growing in the upper Midwest or the Northeast, we've recognized some winter kill. Uh, perhaps we've harvested a bit more aggressively and, and our stand life maybe is down to, to three years. Uh, so when we when I've looked at that winter kill uh, potential, in some cases it's been 50 to 100%, uh, some, some farms, and that's pretty tough, uh, thinking about ripping out uh, dead alfalfa stands or, or needing to reseed new seeding. I mean, that, that's, been, that's been weighing on me in 2019, 2020, uh, even 2021, but uh, I've shifted gears a bit, as Corey alluded to, and I, I think in 2022, some of the reward, uh, the aspects of alfalfa that can bring uh, substantial value to our dairies, maybe less in risk in other areas, uh, are, are beginning to, to weigh on me a bit more and perhaps win out. So rather than, than look at uh, and assume we're all planting alfalfa, I'm going to take kind of a step back and look at uh, what goes into our decision in regards to does it make sense to plant alfalfa or not. So what's changed uh, and, and has sort of shifted my thought process has been that that uh, expensive protein that Corey alluded to, and then also recognizing uh, extreme volatility over the last few years. I mean, what, one thing that uh, is consistent, unfortunately, is our inconsistent prices in, in both class three mill futures uh, and commodity prices uh, in, in terms of inputs, feed costs. And then also, as Corey mentioned, uh, more recently, inflation is running rampant. Uh, in fact, I heard this morning that we're at 40 year highs for inflation. So domestically, the dollar is not working as hard for us. And uh, that's equating to more expensive everything, absolutely everything. So uh, I wonder if investments we make today, perhaps in a perennial crop, may look even better with years to come where that dollar just isn't worth as much. Uh, in terms of exports, what the dollar strength looks like relative to international markets, I, I don't know. I'm not entirely certain what the long-term ramifications are, but it comes back to managing risk. Uh, so recognizing today that feed costs are on the higher end of long-term trends, we're going to focus on protein today. Uh, soybean meals carrying around $400 a ton price tag, uh, and, and I'm going to assume that that price tag is going to going to be here with us for a while. So uh, yesterday would have marked my late father's 67th birthday, but as I walk in his footsteps in, in animal nutrition and, and thinking with a, a dairy owner, 
mindset, we, we, we look for ways to make it work and, and that make it work today is going to be in economic terms. So as we wade down uh, this little bit new path that I, that I put together and, and trust that you'll probably see some content from me uh, in the Hordes and Hedge Forge team with Feeding Fundamentals and in the Lab Analysis column that I write periodically, we're going to use this content uh, in different ways. But it's new as of today. Uh, I enjoyed the opportunity in collaborating with Dr. Don Miller and Doug Bastian with uh, Alfred Seeds. They provided me some great data in regards to inputs and yields. And then I also leaned heavily on the ISU prop production costs, uh, which you can access by just a quick Google of, of prop production costs. And, and really, uh, I, I want to center on that because what we need to do is understand what does it cost to grow a ton of alfalfa? What I've found uh, in, in terms of looking at what does it cost to produce a ton of corn or an acre of corn as well as a, an acre of alfalfa is a lot of growers don't necessarily know their numbers. So hopefully one point you can take home from this is recognizing there's a great resource from ISU out there that you can plug in. It's a worksheet. And you can nail down, drill down uh, by putting in your seed cost, your inputs, crop protection, harvest cost. What is the cost to produce an acre? And then if you have a handle on your yields, you can figure out what your cost per ton actually is. And that's important for the ways that we're going to look at alfalfa economically today. So as I waded through this, I'm not going to go through it in detail, uh, but I recognized working with uh, Dr. Don and Doug's numbers and then some of my own through the ISU worksheet was that we're probably sinking somewhere in the neighborhood of $550 to $680 per year into an acre of alfalfa. That was with a $125 cash rent equivalent, $65 uh, per crop harvest cost, roughly $215 in fertilizer and chemical and some other costs, which I, I didn't denote here. And then to balance that out, I looked at uh, and assumed roughly five to eight ton of dry matter. Uh, I looked at uh, uh, a two and four cutting scenario over the a three to five year lifespan. So that five ton per acre would have been the new seeding year. And then uh, eight ton per acre would have been years two, year three, where the alpha is, really, alpha is really productive for us. And then I looked at perhaps six tons in year four or five if we took it out that far. But really boiling this all down through the worksheet and, and through a, a calculation I put together, uh, at a 90% dry matter basis, the cost per ton, and I use 90 dollars per ton because we're going to look at alfalfa relative to soybean meal specifically, I estimated that we have about $95 per ton into alfalfa. So that's certainly more expensive than perhaps we made a, uh, we might have made alfalfa uh, five, 10 years ago when it might have been $75 to $85 a ton. But I don't think it's anywhere near the increase in cost that we've recognized with some of our other protein feeds. So as we uh, kind of get into the midst of this and then closer to the finish line of at least my section, I look at uh, alfalfa a couple of different ways. Uh, we're going to look at the value of soybean meal equivalent that alfalfa provides perhaps to your diet, really centered on the crude protein, not considering the fiber or the starch, but just looking at the crude protein. Uh, and again, this is a little bit different way that I've looked at alfalfa today and uh, used that $400 per ton value and converted uh, what we can harvest per acre into soybean meal equivalent, something that you can wrap your arms around, think about a ton and a truckload of soybean meal that you might bring be bringing onto your farm to feed your animals. But could we make more money perhaps by growing that per acre? I think so. And then I also looked at alfalfa through feed valve version 7.0, uh, which is a, a worksheet available from the University of Wisconsin, uh, where I collaborated with Victor Cabrera, a few others, uh, where we can do some evaluations. So there's a lot going on in this slide. I hope to distill it down to just a couple of key points. There's a top half and a bottom half, and, and I'll, we'll do the best I can to wade through this pretty quickly. On the top half, that is the result of our economic evaluation one, where we look at alfalfa versus soybean meal. So what I did here is looked at the five crop years from left to right, and I calculated based on the tons per acre at a 22% crude protein value, how many tons of crude protein are we actually harvesting on a dry matter basis? And we don't tend to think of alfalfa like this, but in regards to thinking about how much Soybean meal, perhaps, are we harvesting per acre? I, I think it, it's warranted. So we're harvesting somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.1 to 1.8 tons of crude protein value per, uh, out of our alfalfa acres each year. When I convert that into soybean meal equivalents, that's around two and a half to four tons of soybean meal harvested per acre per year. At a $400 per ton value, we could think of alfalfa netting out around $1,000 to $1,600 of soybean meal equivalent per acre per year. That's a pretty dramatic number to think about uh, each alfalfa. Recognizing that we have somewhere around $650 to $680 in cost of production per acre, if we take that back out, we come back to the net return that alfalfa could uh, 
put back into our pockets, uh, perhaps with supplanting for, uh, soybean meal, of r- roughly $400 to $1,000 per acre. So thinking back to some of the numbers that, that Glenn just presented before, uh, $400 to $700 net return per acre, these numbers are in that uh, realm as well, although going about it in a completely different fashion. So alfalfa can certainly net quite a bit of value in, in uh, soybean meal equivalents. Alternatively, when utilizing the feed valve tool, uh, rather than take $95 per ton as uh, on the bottom half of the screen now, I used $115 per ton, just goosed up that, that price just a little bit uh, in terms of what it would cost to produce. And then I looked at alfalfa relative to a number of other protein sources we could buy off the market, canola meal, uh, soybean meal, and then a number of others that you may see on the screen, ranging in price from 220 to 600 $700 per ton if we're looking at urea. And what I want to point out here is that even at $115 per ton uh, in our cost to produce a ton of alfalfa, we're talking dairy quality alfalfa here, the economic value of that compared to these other feeds is roughly $275 per ton. So when we look at the actual price relative to the uh, market value, it's less than 50% of the market value. So we can grow alfalfa, we can grow a very high quality feed uh, and pretty cheap protein with alfalfa on our farms. So in closing my session out, uh, I'm happy to admit here, I'm, I'm flip-flopping a bit on this. I, I had a friend actually text me a little bit earlier and, and say, hey, I thought you were a corn solids guy. What are you, what are you doing on an alfalfa webinar? And it, to his credit, yes, I've, I've been promoting corn solids uh, and, and discussing some of the consistency that corn and, and some other annuals can, can uh, produce for us. However, with the changing in economics, uh, certainly with expensive protein prices, I didn't even mention inputs, um, that, that certainly warrants considering as well. But I think it, it really makes sense to take a hard look at alfalfa again in 2022 and beyond. I think there's potential to grow roughly $1,300 of uh, soybean meal equivalent per acre, if you want to think about it like that, and offer a net return of uh, somewhere around, I don't know, $500 to $1,000 per acre, maybe about an average of six to $700, depending on how long we keep our stands uh, on, on farm. And then uh, just closing out, I, I think with, uh, you know, this is, if I had my crystal ball, I guess I wouldn't be sitting here today, I'd be playing the lottery, but we could very well eclipse a $275 per value uh, it, it, with a, a ton of alfalfa. For example, if, if we recognize, I, I saw earlier today, Argentina has experienced a bit of a drought, maybe some drier weather. Uh, our prices of protein and then the, the value of our forages could, could just keep ramping up from here. So uh, some things to keep in mind, hopefully you can take a couple of these points home, maybe uh, bring up some different questions and I look forward to entertaining those. John, thanks for the really good walkthrough on, on the economics part of that. That's not easy and I really appreciate the candor and easy to follow dialogue on that. So we'll come back to some questions in a little bit, but let's go to our final poll question here. It's poll question number three. What herbicide decision do you consider the most important when alfalfa is the next crop in the rotation, the primary weed problem to control? If alfalfa will be planted alone or with a grass mix, and select or selection of a Roundup versus conventional seed variety. So go ahead and uh, answer those poll questions. And as we're doing that, I'll invite our next presenter, Earl, to go ahead and turn on his webcam. And so we'll give everybody a little bit of time to answer that. And as a reminder to our audience, please go ahead and ask your questions in the GoToWebinar control panel, and we'll get those answered after Earl gives his presentation. So let's go ahead and see those poll results here and um, most of our audience 62 percent says the primary weed problem to control so we're going to invite dr earl creech to their alfalfa live stream and we're going to talk about this entire complex here earl is professor and extension agronomist at utah state university earl grew up on a family livestock and production farm near logan utah and received his bachelor and master degrees from Utah State University before earning his PhD at Purdue University in Indiana. Then Earl spent three years at the University of Nevada at Reno as an extension weed specialist before joining and accepting his current position at Utah State University. In his research and extension efforts, Earl works to address critical agronomic issues facing farmers and ranchers in Utah and throughout the Western United States. Earl, I look forward to your presentation on previous crop herbicides. Are they impacting alfalfa establishment? Earl, it's all yours. Excellent. Thanks, Corey, and, and it's great to be, w- be with you all today. 
Um, we're going to talk about a subject that's not often talked about when we when we talk about alfalfa weed management, and that is what happens in the previous crop and and the, the herbicides that we apply, and could there be a a potential herbicide effect on that establishing alfalfa? Let's see if my I can advance these things. Oh, sorry, not used to the delay. So I speak, I, I do a lot of research on, on alfalfa weed management and, and I test lots of things and I, I speak about alfalfa weed, weed management all over the West and all over the US. And one of the things that's, that's a pretty common theme with alfalfa weed control is that all alfalfa herbicides, all herbicides labeled in alfalfa cause injury to alfalfa. Some is very obvious with bleaching and yellowing and, and burning type, type symptoms. Uh, some is more subtle with with stunning and even even Roundup Ready alfalfa we we see injury when we apply when when the temperatures are are really cold. Um, the other thing that 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 um, we we learn with alfalfa herbicides is that alfalfa, when established, is a very resilient plant. This is a a, a plant that's able to um, it's able to withstand almost almost anything. I mean, it's got that deep tap root, it's a resilient plant. And when we cause this type of harm, like you see on your screen, it's it's always amazed me how we can come back in a in a month and you and you look around and you you, you can't see any of it anymore. It's completely grown out of it. And so time heals all uh, wounds when it comes to alfalfa herbicides. However, there is an exception. And alfalfa is not always an established plant. Uh, when it's a young establishing seedling, it's a it's a real weakling. I mean, this is a it's a small seeded plant. Pretty much anything that uh, any any stress or any type of unfavorable condition that that alfalfa uh, experiences during establishment will 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 tip it over. It'll it'll cause it to to um, to die. And herbicides in the soil are are certainly an, a factor that could contribute. So I've thought a lot about about this and how to approach this subject because we've got a nationwide audience, all sorts of different crop rotations leading into alfalfa, all sorts of uh, crop production practices that that uh, all of you employ, and and so we won't be able to talk about individual herbicides and 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 specific weed situations, but. But I, I, I thought that maybe it would be best to come up with or to talk about some, some general guidelines and things that, that you can take and employ on your specific operations to, 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 to think about and to, to help you to avoid any type of herbicide carryover injury to alfalfa. So we'll talk a little bit about labels. We'll talk a little bit about the importance of planning ahead. Then we'll jump over and talk about some of the, the, the agronomic or external type factors that can, can affect herbicide persistence. And then we'll finally conclude by talking about a field bioassay. <clears throat> labels. So all herbicide labels have, have instructions regarding plant back restrictions and the, the potential of herbicides to persist and impact subsequent crop growth. And what I've got here is a, is a table that shows some common herbicides, thing that, things that you may currently use on your farm or maybe you've used them in the past. Um, but labeled in, in a number of different crops. But uh, what I really wanted to draw your attention to is out here on the, uh, on the far column, you'll see that there's alfalfa planting intervals very widely across these herbicides. Oops, sorry. Um, you've got everything from 34 months with, with uh, Ally to uh, Atrazine, which would be do not plant alfalfa next year after you apply it and uh, to, to, to four months with, with dual. And uh, one that's kind of interesting here is Velpar at the bottom. Velpar is probably the most common alfalfa herbicide used anywhere. Um, it's really a, a workhorse in weed control, but it's only an al established alfalfa. And if we, if we apply an established alfalfa, we cannot reseed or plant new alfalfa for the next two years with that particular herbicide. So, Read the label of the products you're thinking of using. Follow whatever the label says, and um, and uh, yeah, pay attention to those. 
<clears throat> I think we've all had experiences on on roller coasters, and I think the importance of planning ahead can best equate it to a ride on a roller coaster. So we to, to ride on a roller coaster, we kind of work ourselves up to it. And when we when we get brave, we go and we sit down on the seat. The uh, attendant straps us in, and uh, and then it starts to move. And and sometimes when it starts to move, we the thought crosses our mind, maybe this wasn't a good idea. Maybe I want to get off. But but at that time, there's really nothing that we can do about it. It's you're committed. You've got to just go through the, the the whole ride, all the ups and downs and loops and twists and turns. And sometimes we feel like this young man that's in the front seat of this one, and and we just hold on for dear life and we make it. Um, but when it comes to alfalfa herbicides or herbicides in in rotation with alfalfa, as soon as that herbicide leaves the nozzle and flies through the air and lands on a plant or on the soil, we're committed. We're strapped in and that ride's going. There's nothing that we can do to get off. We have to let that thing ride out and that herbicide's simply gonna have to, to, to break down in the soil and eventually it'll break down to the point that we can plant something else, but there's a, we, we, there, there's a time that, that, that has to pass in order for that to happen. So it's really important to look ahead, to, 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 to think and plan and read the labels and and know what we've got coming up so that we know, um, you know, whether it's a wise idea to plant, to, to use herbicide X, or do we need to, to, to shift over and, and use herbicide Y. <clears throat> Thinking about external factors and things that can influence the length of, of persistence of herbicides, one of the major ones is, is, is the soil and, and, and texture for, for one can have a big effect. So sandy soils are kind of like this, this top, this top box, they're, they're large particles. They're, they're very big. All soils have a charge, it's a, it's a magnetism. That, that magnetism interacts with the magnetic charge on, on herbicide molecules and influences how much herbicides move in the soil. So in a sandy soil, they're, they're big, so they have less charge per unit area. That means that we can see more herbicide movement. When we have clay soils, which would be like you'd see down here in the bottom, smaller particles, um, there's more charge per unit area, and these uh, uh, mean, mean that we'll have less, less herbicide movement. So how does this work in practice? Well, <clears throat> this little diagram shows it. So what we've got are some, some broadleaf and grass plants growing up here. We've got different soil types. So a, a lighter soil on this side over to a heavier soil on this side. And, and we apply the same rate of herbicide across the top and then, and then the moisture takes the, the herbicide down into the soil. What you'll notice is on the lighter soil, that herbicide moved a lot and it became very dilute in the soil very fast. And in fact, in this case, it's not even impacting the growth of the, of, of, of the plants. Um, and, and then as we, as we move to the lighter soils, we see less and less herbicide movement and, and even down here over on this other side, there's hardly any at all. And the practical implication of this is if, we, if we'd applied this herbicide, we came in and planted alfalfa in a, in a, in a sandy soil, the herbicide is gonna be a much more dilute, much more quickly and able to, to, uh, to grow without impacting the, the alfalfa stand establishment. Whereas over here in the, the heavier soils, that herb, herbicide may still be concentrated in that top inch of soil and then we go and plant alfalfa a quarter to a half inch deep um, right into that band of soil and, and we've got a problem. Another thing to think about is the fact that, her, that our soil types vary across fields. I know out here in the West where I often deal with weed management, we can see five or six soil types across a single field. And, and each of those will impact how well, um, you know, how, how the herbicide persists and how it can impact alfalfa growth. Organic matter, uh, obviously ties up herbicides, so the higher the organic matter, the more uh, the herbicide is going to, to, to not move in the soil. And then finally, pH, I don't really have a diagram of that, but, but pH extreme, so if you're dealing in a, on, on farms or in an area that has high, uh, ex extreme high or extreme low pH, herbicide behavior can be totally different than we see anywhere else in the country. So like here in the West, we have high pH soils, um, over eights and into the nines. And so like uh, sulfonyl urea herbicides will last two to three times longer here than they will, will anywhere else in the US. Precipitation. So 
when if I add a drop of herbicide to the high and low precip situations that we see here and then allow the precipitation to to happen, you'll see that that herbicides move more when there's more precip or irrigation. Uh, that moves it down into the soil to where a um, couple things can happen. One is the the more if if with precipitation it can activate the herbicide so that it can actually control weeds. Um, the other thing is that that when the herbicide goes into the soil, it can be subject to the microbes that can break down the herbicide and allow us to rotate our crops. And so in when when we've had little precipitation, little irrigation, we can have problems. Now I know for a lot of us in the in 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 parts of the country, we we had a, a drought year last year. Uh, low precip. Uh, that means that that uh, the herbicides that we applied last year may persist a little bit longer than we that we may anticipate because of those dry conditions. Temperature. <clears throat> um, herbicide breakdown happens differently based on how warm the soil temperatures are. So if I have two or three months of time over the course of a winter, the the soil may be frozen. There's no microbial activity at all. And basically the herbicide that, that went into that cold period and the herbicide in the soil that came out of that cold period are identical. Nothing's happened over that period of time. Whereas in the warmer months, the, the, the soils are very active and the herbicide will break down much more readily. So when we start thinking about length of time after herbicide applications, we need to consider the time of year and how warm the soils are and if the, the, the soils are active. Tillage. One of the old standbys um, to, to help to, to eliminate um, herbicide residual or to help reduce herbicide residual and its effect on subsequent crops has been tillage and mixing that soil. We can, in, in, in less tillage type situations, we can have a concentration of the herbicide on the very top of the soil surface. And as we mentioned before, you plant alfalfa into the top quarter to half inch. It can be a, a, a band of herbicide that can impact growth. Uh, with some tillage, that can be mixed up and 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 uh, diluted a little bit in the soil, and 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 perhaps have less chance of impacting the the growth of the alfalfa. <clears throat> in each field, we have headlands and overlap areas. You know, areas where 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 sprayer the the sprayer pass doubled up or tripled up, and those are areas where we're going to have a higher concentration of the previous crop herbicide, and we are most likely to see herbicide injury or herbicide carryover in, or not, in an alfalfa stand in those types of situations. So that if you're ever called out to take a look at a field where you suspect that maybe herbicide injury is at play, you should see it concentrated in certain areas. And, and one thing to look for would be, would be headlands and where that sprayer is turning on and off and may have doubled up. Early versus late applications. So there are certain herbicides that, that can be applied early in the season. Um, and some that can be applied late. You know, in corn, you can have some that are applied at planting or before planting, and, and, and maybe they can be applied up to, to, to V6 or V8 as well. And so it can be a couple of months later. That, that timing of when that, that application takes place is really important when we start thinking about fall, apply, fall, fall planted alfalfa and, and just the, the timing of the whole operation. So again, pay attention to the label, play, pay attention to how much time you need in order to make that application and, 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 and adjust a, a previous herbicide application accordingly. So a, a really important tool can be a field bioassay. And this sounds like it's pretty highfalutin and scientific, but it's actually quite simple. What you do is you go out into the field, you know, if you've, if, if you've got a field where you've got a question, whether, it, whether it's safe to plant alfalfa, go out into a field, of in question, take a shovel, dig some soil, put it in a bucket or a pot or whatever you want to do, and then um, go to a go to an adjacent field that you know is safe, and 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 dig a little bit more soil and put it in a separate bucket or pot, and then you go and you plant alfalfa in it, and you water it, and then you watch, and and wait, and and as you watch that for the next um, three to four weeks, that alfalfa will start to grow, and you can compare. The, the the field in question versus the safe field and you can watch for things like like the color um you're seeing bleaching are you seeing uh browning are you seeing stunting anything that might suggest that there's something in that soil that may not be favorable for alfalfa growth 
And if, if, if they grow up and you've got that comparison and they look identical, you know that it's safe, go ahead and plant. If something looks suspect, you can you can give it a little bit more time and then and then try again. But that can be a good way that you can that good practical way that you can help to avoid um, a bad situation with um, planting into in the contaminated soil. And that's all I've got. Thanks a lot, Earl. We're going to invite everybody to turn their webcams on, and we're going to go to the question portion of Alfalfa live stream and. A reminder to the audience, go ahead and type questions into the panel and we'll get those answered on the air here. Let's go back, you know, you had a, quite a few Earl uh, different herbicide options and um, controlling weeds and alfalfa. And one of the questions, let's go back to this, do I need Roundup Ready alfalfa to control weeds or can I do it with a conventional variety? You've probably seen it every direction here. What's your take on it? Sure. Roundup Ready Alfalfa is by far the simplest tool for weed management in, in, in alfalfa. Roundup will control big weeds, it'll control small weeds, it'll control annuals, perennials, biennials, it'll control anything. And it'll and um, the, the thing that we encounter when we're when we're trying to control weeds with conventional herbicides is that there's very specific um, requirements on what herbicide controls what particular weed. There are um, there's a weed size restriction. For example, there is no alfalfa herbicide that'll control a weed bigger than about two to four inches tall. You can't go in and control the big trophy, the big trophy weeds. You have to have the small weeds. And so Roundup Ready Alfalfa makes it easy. Um, but if you're if you're thinking ahead, if you're planning ahead, if you're controlling problematic weeds in the crop. The, the previous crop before you plant alfalfa, get those perennial weeds taken care of and anything that's hard to control in alfalfa. Um, it's and and you're on top of it with your with the timing of your application. It's really not not a big deal to control weeds in, in conventional alfalfa with with herbicides. It's interesting you say that or a last year about this time I was developing personally developing a game plan for a a field that was half tillable and 20 years ago, the other half was tillable. We, my dad and I purchased it, and a stand of box elder trees overtook it. I hired a fellow to bulldoze them. We got it somewhat farmable. I went in and seeded, lightly seeded, didn't even till the area where those box elders were, but it was put back to growing conditions and planted a Roundup alfalfa ready variety. At first, the neighbors were all kind of chuckling and pointing. And by about uh, July, they weren't anymore. It had an incredible stand and the weed control was really suppressed. You know, another question, John, came rolling in here. Um, and, and I, as you were talking, I wrote this statement down. To be fair, we've harvested alfalfa more aggressively, but alfalfa needs a chance to store energy in its roots if it's really going to be a perennial crop. So the question is, um, and, and really Glenn probably should tackle this one too, but how many cuts can I go in early for for quality without hurting my stand? And I, I think, you know, that's the balance here. We want to make great cow quality hay, but boy, we need to let that alfalfa plant be a perennial too. Sure, and Glenn, I'll, I'll jump on this first. So despite my agronomy uh, pedigree from the University of Wisconsin, I'll, I'll defer to you uh, for a little bit stronger agronom agronomic thoughts. Uh, in some of my experience, we, I mean, to, to Glenn's points earlier, we need to go out and nail that first cutting. So it's my opinion that we should be uh, fairly aggressive with that first cutting. And then Corey, you're right. We, alfalfa needs a chance to recover, uh, much like being in the gym or whatnot. I mean, if you, you can't just go at it all the time, you, you need to, to rebuild the stores. Uh, and, and so with alfalfa, it needs a chance to, to replenish some of those carbohydrate reserves within the roots so that we don't wipe that stand out in two or three years. So uh, I, I initially coming out of grad school, we, we went after it pretty aggressively, uh, four, five, six cuttings in uh, naturally uh, uh, we're, we're relying upon rainfall. And, and we we had some uh, we did some damage to stand. So I, I've changed my tune just a little bit. Just another another example of me changing my tune. I, I think uh, if we want to let second and third cutting perhaps stretch out just a touch those are going to be a little bit lesser quality in fiber digestibility just due to the growing conditions the heat units that we have in those 
uh, periods of time. But in terms of what can we get done in a year, we also have to play off of Mother Nature in the upper Midwest and the Northeast. Out by Glen, uh, where we're relying on uh, irrigation and under circles, a little bit different. Glenn, your comments? Yeah, I, I, you've got it right. Um, <clears throat> it, it's the last cutting is the most important cutting from stand persistence. So, and we know that the rate of quality decline for that last cutting is the slowest. So, next to first cutting, I would say the last cutting is the most important. Uh, let it flower; it'll still be pretty good hay. You can still blow up cows with that last cutting hay, even if it's flowering. So. Uh, that that would be my recommendation. So we talked about the uh, peak sticks earlier, or the uh, predictive um, the predictive sticks. And uh, one of the viewers chimed in that the Midwest Forage Association is out of stock, and we indeed checked that website out, and that is true. I don't know if anyone knows another source here. I was playing around on the internet trying to find that gentleman a source. Uh, Dodge County, Wisconsin, you can walk into their extension office and buy them, but I don't know a lot of our viewers are going to go do that. Anyone else know a source right now? And it talked, you know, this is a supply chain issue. Another uh, audience member chimed in and, and jokingly said, but there's truth to that, to Roundup, Roundup doesn't work if you can't buy it. So, uh, you know, we, we have some supply chain issues. Uh, anyone know another source of a peak stick? I do not. In the absence of a peak stick, uh, 24 inches is going, uh, we can use a yardstick, 24 inches uh, where we go out and we uh, look at a random square foot of alfalfa. Uh, don't look for the tallest alfalfa in your field, but just go out and plop that that uh, yardstick down and then within a square foot around that, find the tallest stem, stretch it out against that yardstick. And if we harvest at 24 inches, that should net us out somewhere in the neighborhood of 175 to 185 relative forage quality alfalfa. So 24 inches and using a yardstick can be a fallback. Yeah, in, in the Northwest, uh, there are some labs that actually go out and do cuttings and they provide that service on their website. For example, Northwest Labs uh, does that and they've done it for years. So that's another good source. Unfortunately, we've, we're losing some of our extension forage people that could continue and and refine those works for example we need to try to calibrate that on ndf digestibility get away from rfv and and go to what people are going to be using but without funding and people to do it that's it's gonna it's gonna take a while well we got a lot of questions rolling in here right now so we're gonna go through these a little bit faster uh, uh, one of the re uh, audience members chimes in. I read in a magazine that national legume average was four to, for alfalfa uh, harvest was four to five tons per acre, and I'm sure that's citing USDA data. At times in past, and this is a fellow that's been in our industry for a while, he remembers eight tons per acre, and that's probably a little bit of the quality versus tonnage trade-off here. But uh, talk about the yield trajectory on alfalfa here, if someone wants to jump in on that. Yeah, I, I think, you know, USDA has to rely on survey data for a lot of this. And frankly, only the information is only as good as the input into it. So I think there's fewer producers, they're less likely to provide information. So, so we're lacking in that. But for example, in Idaho, uh, you know, my variety trials, I can get 10, 11 tons per acre, but that's fresh cut. Uh, and so uh, from a harvest loss standpoint, it is eight tons per acre. Meanwhile, the USDA data says we're four tons per acre. So, and that affects the total value of alfalfa and forages in the whole, you know, compared to potatoes and wheat, on and on and on. So. That's another uh, effort that need, needs to be made to try to get the best data we can. Earl, we're going to send this question to you, and this is probably a little bit of uh, uh, water availability and other things, but the question comes in very simply. When is the ideal time to plant alfalfa? It totally depends. It depends on where you are, it depends on moisture availability. Um, I 
you know, for, for me, I really like fall planting. I like in, in our environment, if we can, we can come in and plant the end of August, first part of September, we have irrigation water available. We can usually get the crop up and going well, and we can get a, a full suite of cuttings the next year and versus versus waiting to the spring when you get that reduction but it totally depends on when you've got water when you've got enough growing season to get it established and um, a, a lot of other factors so it depends we're going to go to speed round here with questions are rolling in fast and so i'm going to call on one commentator and after that response is done if there's anyone that wants to chime in i'll just give a pause of three seconds glenn i'm going to call you this question does all alfalfa grow at the same rate? Uh, no. Uh, yeah, basically no. Within a, a fall dormancy class, it's it's hard to distinguish, even in variety trials. So environment is is more of a factor there. Uh, I think we're going to call on John for this next one. What's the value of adding grasses or any other perennial forbs? <clears throat> like plantain or to the mix. And really, and maybe we'll come to Earl on that one too real quick. And, and the value I'm thinking here is the value to the animal when asking you, John. All right, so it, if we add grass to the mix, I, I, I gotta speak to it, it being somewhat of a risk balance from uh, if that alfalfa doesn't establish, maybe that, that grass will come out and help us in that first year. From, from the animal standpoint, I mean, I don't think if, if we harvest and we grow a good quality crop, I don't see grass necessarily bringing a whole lot of, of added nutritional value to that alfalfa stand. It's, it's going to be a challenge to manage it and get that maturity matched up. So it could even be a detriment. From the, from the standpoint of weed management, it can be a huge hurdle because there's very few herbicides that can be used on, on, a, on an alfalfa grass mix. And so it really, hamstrings us, you know, ties our hands about what we can possibly use to control weeds. Glenn, how much bloom is sufficient to allow alfalfa to replenish its reserves for survival? Well, that's another thing. If we could predict the, the weather accurately, we would know that. Um, but, but basically, alfalfa needs to get eight to 10 inches tall. Then it's, it, it's building reserves. Uh, whereas it's taken the first few inches is the worst part because that's all comes from root reserves before it forms a canopy. Thank you. Uh, John, this may go to you here and anyone else, and maybe Glenn. You mentioned 24 inches should equal 175 RFE. I'm assuming this is an estimate for varieties that are not low linden varieties, that they'd be more conventional. Yeah, that dates back probably 10 years uh, in, in experience here. Is that, so the, uh, harvesting at 22 to 24 is, is going to be, uh, like Glenn mentioned before, uh, pretty high quality, probably 210, 215 in the field as it stands green. But through harvest losses and fermentation, we should be able to feed out 175 to 185 relative forage quality uh, out of that first cut. That's going to be pretty high fiber digestibility. Uh, but that yes, that that is conventional varieties. Glenn, this yeah, one... Go ahead, John. I would just add that indeed the, the low lignin uh, expands that window and the rate of change if we measure it, <clears throat> excuse me, by NDF digestibility is, is a much better measurement. Glenn, we're going to ask this question of you and this is really again about, a, it's relating to the predictive equations of alfalfa quality peak. Do fall dormancy three versus fall dormancy four or a fall dormancy five, does in, in the spring of the year, does that work the same, that stick work the same on all those varieties or is it impacted by how quickly the alfalfa comes out of dormancy? I, it, yes, <clears throat> uh, theoretically it is affected by the fall dormancy. In that study that I mentioned, however, that's the reason we had different varieties. We, we we had as checks different fall dormancies. And in that case, it wasn't a real significant factor. But I have seen a lot of years where, particularly in the spring, uh, for example, a fall dormancy six in our area with a heavy frost, it just knocks it way back. Uh, whereas it doesn't seem to hurt the uh, 
the fall dormancy three or two even especially. Okay. I'm gonna if Ron is able to, I'm gonna have him turn his webcam on because he I think there's a question here he's gonna answer. But I got one more here for Earl. What is your opinions on coated seed versus non-coated seed uh, with the same seed treatment? So we're talking about obviously a stand establishment here. Yeah, um, coated coated seed has a basically take the seed and you have a, a clay coating and and that coating can include some you know some inoculant and some fungicides and some other things like that and and it's. You know, I, I I think most most seed today is is coated, seems to 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 work really well, um, and the idea is that 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 clay coating absorbs the water and helps get you more uniform germination. I you know in our variety trials though we often test uncoated seeds and and they work just fine too. So I don't really I don't really have a preference. Um, just whatever whatever the I think the more important thing is the genetics. And making sure you plant the right variety because there's there can be so much yield difference between these different varieties and the and the performance of them. Thank you, Earl. And Ron, this is more of a product question. And one of the audience members asked, is there a harv extra variety that is not Roundup ready? Or are they all Roundup ready varieties? Uh Corey, they are all Roundup ready varieties. They are there's nothing out there that just has the Harv extra trait. Um so they they're both they're always stacked with the Roundup Ready tree. I knew you could answer that one, so I wanted to uh, bring you on board. So we did. Those are all the audience questions. So thank you for those insightful questions, and I want to thank our speakers for the answers they provided today. If you have additional questions, you can always send them in, and we will uh, get those answered after the Alfalfa live stream. Following the webinar, audience members will receive a short survey about our program. Please fill that out so that we can better serve you in our future Alfalfa live streams. And speaking of future webinars, please mark your calendar for the next webcast in this Alfalfa live stream series. Our next presentation will take place February 10th, 2022, same time, 11 a.m. Central Time. That alfalfa live stream will be titled Adapting Alfalfa Production to Climate Change. And it again will be sponsored by L4X Seeds. Our guests will include Dr. Ian Ray from New Mexico State University, Dr. Deborah Samak, and Dr. Joshua Gamble, both with USDA ARS. And we look forward to having them. And I know with that strong lineup, it'll be another great program just like this program was today. On behalf of Ron Cornish, Glenn Shoemaker, John Gazer, and Earl Creech, I'm Corey Geiger, your host. Thank you for joining us today on Alpha Alpha Livestream, and I wish you all a good day. Goodbye, everyone.